Hi everyone, uh, my name is Nina and I am the Events and Communications Officer here at the AUC. Welcome to, today, to today's exchange webinar. The title of this exchange is Salix College Energy Fund, How to Apply, and it will at last for approximately one hour. Thank you for registering and thanks also to the team at Salix Finance and Martin Sings from City College Plymouth who will be leading today's webinar. Just a little bit of housekeeping to go over now. Um, I'm hoping everyone can hear me well. Uh, for the time being, I have placed all of your microphones on mute to avoid background noise. You will have opportunities um, throughout the webinar, especially at the end, to ask questions. So please unmute yourselves during uh, this session by clicking on the microphone button to the right-hand side of your name at the top right of the screen. If you don't have a working microphone, please type any questions you have into the on-screen chat box, uh, which can be found in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. If you have any technical issues at all throughout this webinar, please let me know by posting them into this chat box or by sending me an email to nbartlett at eauc.org.uk. This webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded as a resource with all presentations later on today. Please feel free to share this resource with anyone who may be interested. Once the webinar has finished, you will be sent a short survey for us to gain your feedback. Please take a few minutes to complete this survey as the results will help us to improve our CPD and events. That's all from me for now. Thanks again for registering, and I will now pass you over to Charlie from Salix. Oh, no, it's actually going over to, to a vet to start with. Um. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so thank you to everyone for joining us today. We're going to be giving you a short presentation on the third run, round of funding available for further education colleges. My name's Yvette and I'm the PR and Marketing Officer at Salix and I'm also joined by two of my colleagues, Charlie Reith-Pert, who is the main contact for the Salix College Energy Fund, and Matt Cavill, who is our Technical Services Coordinator. Um, the presentation today will be in five short parts and then there will be a chance for your questions at the end of the session, as Nina mentioned. Um, first, I'm going to give you a bit of a background on Salix Finance and then Charlie will take over to give you some information on our previous two rounds of the College Energy Fund. We will then move on to talk about our third round of funding that is now available. After that, Martin Singh from City College Plymouth will be giving a short presentation on his experiences with projects um, that have been funded by Salix. And then we'll look at some more case studies of colleges that Salix have funded in the past. And then finally, we'll look at the application process for our interest-free loans. Um, so firstly, Salix, we were set up in 2004 as an independent, publicly funded, not-for-profit company to help the public sector drive down their energy bills and to reduce their carbon footprint through interest-free loans energy efficiency projects. We are funded by the Department for Energy and Climate Change, the Department for Education and the Scottish and Welsh Government. We support local authorities, schools, colleges and universities and the NHS throughout England, Scotland and Wales. As you can see now, we have grown quite substantially since 2004. From an initial 19 pilot clients, we now support over 1,100 organisations, funding 13,000 projects worth around £376 million. This amounts to carbon savings of 538,000 tonnes a year and energy savings of £98 million for the public sector. Now I'm going to pass you over to my colleague Charlie who will be speaking to you about the College Energy Fund in more detail. Thank you very much Yvette. Um, and as mentioned previously, um, my name is Charlie and I am the main contact for the Salix College Energy Fund. So a bit of background um, in terms of our work with colleges. To date we've worked with over 201 different colleges in England, Scotland and Wales and we funded 1,800 projects worth £37 million. Over the lifetime of these projects, um, they're set to save colleges around £105 million and 666,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide. In terms of our, our previous successes, 
Um, in, in partnership with the EAUC and supported by the AOC, there has been two previous successful rounds of the College Energy Fund. Uh, each round had a total of £5 million of funding available, and we've seen 55 colleges apply over the span of both rounds. Throughout the two rounds, we received applications um, that, that were of, of a great variety and different technology types. Um, this included boiler upgrades, LED lighting, BMS insulation, uh, among others, and the project is set to save £26 million and £132,000 of CO2 over their lifetimes. Moving on now, looking at the third round of the Salix College Energy Fund, um, continuing from the success of previous work, um, we, we launched the fund in October, and again, it's also supported by the EAUC, um, sorry, in partnership with the EAUC and supported by the AOC. Um, we've already received two applications for this third round, and we're, we are accepting applications through until Friday the 29th of January 2016. Um, projects are going to be assessed on an ongoing basis, so those that are successful are going to be awarded funding once they've passed their technical assessment so there's no waiting around for, for, the, for the deadline there. Any publicly funded further education college is eligible to apply, and in terms of compliance, all Salix funded projects must be based on additionality. So this means that the project would not have gone ahead without Salix funding. And then there are two other main compliance criteria, and they are a maximum of a five-year payback and the project must cost less than £100 per tonne of carbon dioxide. So this means that it must cost less than £100 to save one tonne of carbon over the lifetime of the project. It's also worth noting as well that when projects do exceed the maximum payback criteria of five years, applicants are welcome to contribute to the overall cost in order to make the project compliant. So essentially what we're saying is we fund up to the five-year payback. Now I would like to pass, it, pass things over to, to Martin from City College Plymouth, who, who's kindly going to be giving a short presentation on his experiences with Salix. So over to Martin. Hello, everyone. I, uh, I hope you can hear me. I had a few technical issues just now. Am I coming through loud and clear? Yes. Yes. Yeah, we are. can You're hear you, Martin. Fine. That's good. Uh, okay, uh, City College Plymouth. We have two main sites. Kings Road Negotiation Centre. So we're, we're a fairly large organisation, just to put uh, what we do in, into context. <coughs> um, we've, uh, we've, we've done several projects um, using Salix as, uh, uh, as the way of funding it. Um, about five years ago, we, we sort of embarked uh, down the road of using Salix with uh, replacing of our, our main borders. Um, we, we replaced um, a couple of very old all-fired borders with um, some modern uh, condensing borders, um, and um, the, the, the project uh, was, was done used, using a consultant, and the consultant's fees were included within the project cost, um, and that is something that you can do, so you don't have to do it entirely on your own. Um, we also upgraded the building management system and improved the controls on the building, and we've also done some uh, cavity wall insulation. Um, the, uh, we decided uh, um, last year that we would um, pursue some additional uh, Salix finance, and uh, we looked at a much larger scheme. We didn't really want to start using uh, uh, sort of Salix to, to fund smaller schemes, so we decided to look at something much bigger. And initially, we started looking at grouping projects together. Um, this, in the end, turned out not to be the way uh, for us to, to go with the, the, the five projects that we initially selected, um, because only three of the projects actually would have uh, succeeded in getting through. So we decided to submit them as individual projects. Um, we, you know, we've looked at uh, uh, replacing uh, LED, uh, lighting with LED. We, we've put over 500 LED light fittings in over the summer in the main building. Um, we've looked at improving our uh, heating controls in the main building. And uh, we've also done some additional uh, uh, thermal insulation in the boiler room. <clears throat> there was one other project that uh, we, we were looking at doing uh, where we were going to 
look at replacing transformers, transformers with super low loss. Uh, unfortunately, this relied too heavily on equipment manufacturer determining potential savings, which is a bit of a pitfall. <clears throat> Uh, the SALIX application process is relatively straightforward. Um, the, the important criteria really is uh, identifying suitable projects, and you know we feel the, uh, the the key to this really is robust energy management. If you're measuring and monitoring um, your energy consumption and uh, and reporting on that, uh, it easily uh, leads into identifying projects which could be financed uh, using SALIX. <coughs> The preparation of information for compliance tools um, is it can be time consuming um, and uh, you know you have to have a lot of uh, supplementary information available for that. The compliance tools themselves are relatively easy to use, and uploading documents to the to the website is is um, is, is straightforward um, and Salix uh, after application submitted Salix uh, assess the projects and um, they can provide a, a huge amount of information to help you through the process. <clears throat> uh, one thing you have to remember with the Salix uh, loan is that it is it is a loan in the true sense and it can have an impact on your organization's credit score. So if you you know if you're in the in the process of um, raising finances to, to do other major projects uh, you do have to bear that in mind. Once the projects are completed, Salix are able to quickly process the documentation and release their own amounts, so there's not a lot of waiting around. Um, I think with the, the projects that we, we've done over the summer, uh, there, there was something like a two to three week turnaround, which was you know, fairly quick. <coughs> uh, other useful hints and tips. Uh, it's important to always have projects identified in readiness to, to say, uh, for, for Salix funding. So don't sit around waiting for um, Salix to have the next tranche of, of money available. It's a good idea to have projects uh, waiting in the wings, ready to ready to sort of um, submit uh, as, as, as applications. Um, the other important criteria is to ensure you have full senior leadership commitment. Um, you can spend an awful lot of time and effort putting together a Salix application only to find that your senior leadership have different plans for finances particularly and uh, you know the, 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 um, the, the whole scheme gets uh, gets scuppered. <clears throat> the other thing to remember as well is that you can allow for inflation of uh, energy unit costs so don't use current energy costs. Um, Salix can advise on um, uh, the way that they um, would like to uh, sort of estimate um, inflated energy costs which can be used over the course of the five years um, and these do improve paybacks. <coughs> Equipment manufacturers can help to provide product information, uh, carry out surveys, provide uh, energy saving data. Um, the, the, the one proviso there is to be wary of relying too heavily on manufacturers information. They, they may know their product and they may know, uh, uh, you know how, en how it could save you energy. They don't necessarily understand how you might use it, so it's important to bear that in mind. <coughs> um, and you know, use Salix for advice both on the application process and for technical queries. Um, we, we've always found them very, very willing to, to help, and uh, the, the uh, standard of technical advice is, is very good. So, so please bear that in mind. And uh, lastly, why we do it, um, you know, this is uh, uh, just a little indication of, of where we've taken our um, carbon performance versus our target. We, we decided uh, many years ago to set a 34% reduction in CO2 emissions by, two, by 2020. Um, and um, we, we've actually, uh, this is a little bit of an old chart, we've actually um, recently uh, exceeded that target and uh, have re reset our sights now on a target of 43% by 2020. So we're we're always continually improving and uh, if necessary moving the moving the goalposts in the right direction um, so, so that we're always stretching ourselves on what we do. Uh, thank you very much. Hi, uh, yeah, it's uh, Matt Cavill speaking here. I am the uh, Technical Services Manager at Salix. Um, I just wanted to uh, build on uh, um, Martin's fantastic presentation. Uh, as you can see, he's uh, 
uh, use Salix funding um, to do some great projects here. Um, and that last slide was particularly interesting. Um, the college has really exceeded some quite ambitious targets there, so it's very positive to see. Just to give you a bit of background to what I do, um, I am the manager of the technical services department. There's about four of us that work in the department. Uh, we do the uh, review of the projects that come through to us. Uh, we do a reasonableness review on the savings just to check that everything looks in line with what we typically see. We compare them to projects that we have seen come through for Salix funding um, across all the different technology types that we fund. Um, the other part of that, uh, what we do is um, offer a bit of technical support and advice to clients that are looking to put in a Salix application or if you just have any general questions on our website or technologies. Um, for example, if you are a bit unsure if, uh, whether we fund a particular technology, then it's always best just to get in contact with us and we're more than happy to help. So what I wanted to do here was just take you through and uh, a few additional case studies to um, Martin's project here, just to try and give you a, a bit of a flavor of, sort of what other colleges are doing at the moment. So, what I'm going to take you through is a few case studies, uh, and uh, primarily it's something uh, on our website called Project Knowledge Slides. These can all be found and downloaded from our knowledge sharing area on the website. This is an area of uh, the website that um, uh, clients will need to register for. It's for public sector bodies to access only. So what will happen is when you sign up for a, um, a, an email to access our website, we'll get a quick message through and we'll grant you access to the knowledge sharing area. If you have a public sector email address, or in your cases, um, uh, a college uh, relevant email address, uh, on this uh, website you're able to access information on the different technologies we fund, uh, some case studies, the project knowledge slides, all of our compliance tools, there's some best practice calculations uh, that are available to download. For example, we have um, guidance on doing heat loss calculations for uh, insulation, um, some additional client support material, uh, and regional meeting material, which generally holds the different presentations that we presented at Salix. So now I just wanted to take you through a couple of our project knowledge slides, um, focusing on some other great college projects that were funded in the last couple of rounds of Salix. So I'm going to kick off with uh, Barnsley College, um, who did a LED lighting upgrade. LED lighting is one of the more popular technologies that we see come through Salix. Um, the technology is, um, over the past, uh, I believe, four years now, we've really seen LED technology take over uh, fluorescent lighting upgrades. I think as the cost of the LED technology has really been driven down, the amount of projects we've seen, co seen come through has really, really grown. So Barnsley College here, we're replacing a mixture of five-foot fluorescents and compact fluorescent fittings. Uh, they were going uh, for a direct LED replacement with new fittings, so they're completely gutting out the old fittings and replacing with new technology there. You can see the kind of uh, financial savings they're getting on this project. They're um, estimating £17,000 uh, a year saving through upgrading to LED, which worked out at about four-year uh, payback, which is around about typical for what we are seeing with colleges and the operational hours that the sites generally have. The second slide contains um, some supporting comments. Um, uh, all of the project knowledge slides um, have this two-slide format. So the first slide is the before and after. The second slide is more just around tips and uh, hints that people have kind of worked up over their project. And it's always good just for a bit of knowledge sharing to share this with our client. Um, uh, general information such as uh, um, uh, the operational hours and the lighting, which obviously um, were factored quite greatly into a calculation for lighting. Um, the electricity price, um, whether they've included any inflation, for example, uh, the supplier that was used, and any additional advice and lessons learned. Um, I think uh, just building, I think what Martin had said before about being prepared and prior to, uh, prior to submitting your application, I think that's quite a good tip. Uh, um, you know, not waiting for next rounds with Salix funding to come through if you have projects that you're kind of building in the pipeline alongside uh, that can be ready for when the next round of Salix funding is available. Um, I think it's always a good tip, so you're, you're there ready to go once that next round of funding has been announced. 
just going to take you through uh, another quick case study for Palmer's College. Um, so they were taking a bit more of a holistic view at their site. So they were doing something called what we call a multiple project site. Uh, so they were doing uh, uh, some heater cabinets, uh, some uh, uh, replacement of fluorescent lighting with LED, and also the replacement of some old boilers here. So as you can see from the first slide and the before, they've got quite considerable uh, consumption of both electricity and gas that they were looking to really drive down as much as possible. So they were replacing um, old T12, T8 fittings with 34 watt LED units uh, and high efficiency condensing boilers with a total project of uh, just under £200,000. And as you can see from the kilowatt hour consumptions post project, um, they had really managed to drive down the gas and electricity especially. The combined projects, so the LED lighting and the boiler upgrades, worked out at around about a four-year payback. I think the, the second and third slide that I have on this project, another slide, will give you a bit more context as to how those savings really came about. So what Palmer's College have done here is really outlined how they've calculated those savings. So you can see there, um, it's the basis of their lighting calculation there. Um, I think the, the interesting one is, is the boiler replacement there. So you can see that they're replacing a number of different boilers, but at the same time, they're really driving down the size of the boilers, resizing for the, uh, the, to really you know, match the site's needs, while at the same time maximizing the efficiency through using a condensing boiler. So they're achieving quite a good saving um, through the boilers alone. Um, just the last note on that page is that the electricity is 10.5 and uh, 2.2 for gas. They haven't said if they've included any inflation, uh, but that's uh, th those uh, prices are around about typical for what we see for these kinds of projects. Palmer's College actually did one additional slide of learning. Um, so they named who their suppliers were, but they also gave a good list of uh, any advice and lessons learned. I won't, I won't take you through them all now. This uh, seminar will be available uh, to download um, once we finish talking, but some of the key points um, I just wanted to point out is perhaps um, looking at your project timing and planning, uh, making sure that all contracts uh, contractors have a copy and are agreed so everyone's on the same page, all the stakeholders are on the same page. So trying to really minimize any project delays as much as possible really helps drive along the projects. Finally, on our knowledge share area, um, we have some case studies which are a bit more uh, general to the project knowledge slides. The project knowledge slides are developed by clients. They are uh, projects that clients have completed using Salix funding. And then uh, once they have completed their projects, they put the uh, slides together themselves. These case studies are, um, are generated internally by Salix. Uh, to give you a bit more of a flavor and an overview of um, projects that uh, other colleges have uh, given, uh, there's, I think, we, how many have we got to download on the website? College one? Um, just general. Um, easily over 40. Yeah, we, we've got about 40 case studies available to download on the website. And as you can see on this slide for Northampton College, they used a £20,000 Salix loan to generate um, annual savings of around about £4,000 working out uh, about a 4.4 year payback. And that was done through um, installing uh, LED lighting um, primarily there. So what I wanted to do now is just to pass you uh, back across to my colleague, Charlie, who's going to take you through how you can apply for Salix funding. Thanks very much for that, Matt. Um, <coughs> Yeah, so I'll be talking you through how you can actually apply for a Salix loan. Um, and the application process it is broken down into uh, into six easy steps. So we would start by, by just registering on the website, and the link is obviously there. And, and as Matt said before, um, this will be available to download, so, so you can get hold of all the links that way. Um, after registering, you can then read the application notes, and again, the, the link's available there. And then complete the online application form with contact details, then move on to completing a compliance tool with the project details, and um, I, I will get Matt to run over that in a bit more detail shortly, and then submit your application online. Um, once, once it's submitted to us, that's then when, when we sort of take over and, and we'll carry out our technical checks and um, 
it'll be in our hands after that after that point. So the first step, registering on the Salix website. So it only takes a few seconds and just requires your name and contact details, um, very similar to any other website you might have signed up to before. And once you've registered, you will then have access to the knowledge share area, which, which Matt kindly explained previously. And then you, if you've already registered for the knowledge share area um, before submitting an application, then it's just the same login details that would be used for the application. So there's no need to register twice there. After registering for the website, um, then is the, the opportunity comes up to, to go through the application notes. And uh, this explains more about the college's program, the compliance criteria, and uh, all the instructions for applying. Once you've read the notes, you can then begin the online application button, uh, online application, sorry, with the green button, which is in the top right-hand corner of the screen. The third step is completing the application form itself. Um, this again is, is very straightforward. It, it requires some contact details, um, not only from the person who, who is applying on behalf of the college, who, who will be our main point of contact during the duration of the project, but also the contact details for the authorizing official at the institute. So that could be the principal, um, the director of chief of finance. Um, but really, it's anyone that has the authority to sign a direct debit mandate. Um, once this has been submitted online, an automatic email will then go out to the authorizing official and it asks them to, to acknowledge that the application has been submitted on the college's behalf and, and they just have to reply to this automatic email giving, giving their approval for the application to go ahead. Um, moving on to the fourth step and that is the compliance tool. Um, which looks quite technical, but it's actually very simple, and uh, Matt is going to explain this in a bit more detail for you now. Okay, so um, the compliance tool um, forms part of your uh, standard application for savings funding. Um, the purpose of the compliance tool is just to capture the basic information about the savings, uh, the project costs, and the type of project that you're doing. We have three tools uh, for you to download. There's a single field compliance tool, which is probably the most general compliance tool we have. That's for projects for, uh, that involve one fuel. So, for example, um, upgrading to LED lighting, um, uh, doing um, perhaps boiler heating controls, for example. Uh, the multiple fuel compliance tool is for use for those projects that in, uh, impact on two or more fuel types. Uh, for example, a um, boiler fuel switch, so if you're switching from oil to gas, or if you're looking to do combined heat and power, which impacts on both your electricity and your gas consumption. Uh, the final tool is our multiple project site tool, which is uh, to be used when you're looking to take a holistic view um, at, your, um, uh, at your site and doing some a holistic uh, approach to energy efficiency. A bit like what we had a look at um, in the project knowledge slide for Palmer's College who are doing LED lighting uh, boilers and a host of different measures, this tool can be used to capture all that information in one. So I'm just going to take you very quickly through uh, what the compliance tool does. So first of all, uh, anything in uh, green is a self-calculated field, anything in white is user input. From the user input, uh, the compliance tool uh, calculates general things like your annual kilowatt hour saving, your financial saving, which is based on the kilowatt hour saving that uh, is input, and the energy price. Uh, the, uh, it also calculates the annual CO2 saving, which is the tons of CO2 per annum there. Um, it also calculates the lifetime CO2, which is based on the persistence factor, which uh, is uh, indicated by the little PF. There. Uh, the persistence factor is generally uh, the lifetime of the technology uh, that you're looking to install. The persistence factors are all included within the Salix compliance tool. If you would like to look at um, the persistence factors, they are held on the second tab of the compliance tools, um, and each technology has its bespoke persistence factor. I believe this one for 25 years would be for LED lighting with replacing the fitting. So what we are effectively doing for this project is counting uh, carbon savings for 25 years for the, an LED lighting project with a new fitting. The second thing the compliance tool does 
is check project compliancy. So um, as Charlie would have mentioned before, there's two main criteria that projects need to conform to. The first one is uh, project payback, and the second one is the cost of CO2 over the lifetime of the project. So you can see for this project, the financial savings, um, well, the project cost divided by the financial savings will give you the project payback in years. So this project here is achieving a payback of around about 4.5 years. Um, the cost of the project divided by the uh, lifetime CO2, which is uh, under column three there, uh, will give you the cost of the lifetime over the lifetime of the project. The uh, cost of uh, lifetime CO2 is just basically a quick measure to uh, give us a flavor of the cost effectiveness of um, the measure it being installed in terms of saving carbon. The final thing the compliance tool does is give a compliant or non-compliant um, outcome at the end there. Compliance tools can be used uh, if you just wanted to check whether your project would be applicable for savings funding. I think it is worth noting now that if the project is not compliant, um, either get in contact with us or clients are able to put in some of their own funding to bring back the payback, uh, drive down the payback, sorry, or really drive down that cost effectiveness. I think we're going to pass back to Charlie now, who's going to continue with the application process. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, moving on to, to step five, so after the compliance tool's been filled out and everything's been submitted online, um, <coughs> We will then also ask you to send in any calculations that you use to fill out the compliance tool. Um, so, so for a lighting project, this could be a breakdown of, of how many lights you'll be replacing, what the old bulb, bulb was and what the new bulb will be, the wattages, and how you calculated the operational hours. Um, also, any quotes and brochures for the specific products you'll be installing, that they'll be very useful in terms of our assessment as well. Um, I'd like to note that if you have a project that's over £100,000, um, you'll also need to submit a Salix business case, and um, the template for this is available on our website um, on the same page as the compliance tools. Then it's over to the sixth and final step of the application process, which is uh, the technical assessment. So, so when we receive the application, our technical team will go through the compliance tool, supporting calculations, uh, and, and they'll be they'll be checking that the college will really be benefiting and achieving the proposed savings. Um, and then for any projects that are over £100,000, we will not only assess them ourselves, but also they go out to our external consultants, Atkins, for a further assessment. So just to go over some of the um, dates uh, for the third round of the Salix College Energy Fund, the deadline for applications is the 29th of January 2016, and as I said, applications will be assessed and funding will be awarded on an ongoing basis. Uh, successful applicants will then be sent a commitment letter, and this is to be signed by the authorising official and then returned to, to us, and, and this, this is a, a way of securing the funding. Once the commitment letter has been signed, uh, you can then begin work. So it gives you the green light to, to go ahead on the on the projects. Um, and the projects have a nine-month completion time frame. So they will be due to be completed by, by November 2016. Um, the loan will then be paid out to you on completion of the project, uh, although we, we can set up interim payments because obviously we understand that that for the ordering of equipment um, and some suppliers will we'll need advance payments. So that's that's not a problem. We can do up to four interim payments totally in, in about 80% of, of the total project value. And finally, the loan repayments will be collected via direct debit um, once the project ha has completed. Um, so obviously it's, it's important to check. I'm sure most colleges are able to, but it's important to check that you can process direct debits. And that about covers everything from us. So, so thank you very much for logging in and listening, and um, I'd like to open the floor to, to any questions now. Okay, so if anyone's got any questions, if they'd like to, um, to use the microphone button to unmute themselves, and that would be great, and we can get a bit of conversation going. But otherwise, um, feel free to type any questions uh, into the chat box at, at the bottom of the screen.
Okay, I haven't, I haven't got, I haven't got any questions coming through. Oh, hello. Um, this is Catherine Middleton calling from the College of West Anglia. Hi, Hi Catherine. Catherine. Hi. Um, the, um, I went to the um, Salix Midlands Regional Meeting um, and spoke to Claire Bannum Godfrey, um, and she gave me details about we did an application last year. Um, yes, and we did have yeah. some problems with initially making our um, our compliance tool fit with the payback and also the tons per uh, CO2. Um, yeah, the pounds per ton. Yes. Yeah, yeah. pounds per ton part. Um, they did suggest a uh, sort of we had a, a mixture of lighting and controls, and we initially put them as separate for each particular building, put them separately, but they suggested combining them would allow us to have not all of the funding, but at least it made it fit the compliance tool, so we, we would have got around 65%. Um, from the thing earlier, I noticed you said about, in terms of the inflation involved with the unit costs, uh, I don't think that was factored into our previous application so I was wondering if you had if Salix could provide more information about how we can calculate that. Hi, hi Catherine, it's, it's Matt Cabill speaking. Hi. Hi, yeah, yeah um, that, no, of course, yeah, uh, putting in some energy inflation is, is something that a lot of our clients do look at. Um, some of the guidance that we have been referred to in the past is to have a look at the uh, deck inflatory prices. Um, right. Uh, it's available to download off the deck website. Um, what I'll do is if I get your contact details from Claire Bannum Godfrey, I'll be mm -hmm. able to zip you across the exact data sheet that DEC provide on energy price inflation. So what that spreadsheet will include is um, inflation for electricity, gas, I think gas oil and fuel oil as well. So you'll be okay. able to take a look at that. They give low, medium and high scenarios for what they anticipate energy inflation to be. But at the end of the day, it's down to your best judgment and knowing your site and your energy tariffs as to what a reasonable level of inflation will be. And as long okay. as you can give us a bit of supporting commentary around it, then it's certainly something that you could look yeah. at in, okay. in your project. Okay. Yeah, because I think I know they use the current unit cost price and obviously bearing in mind over five years, that might what is bound to yeah. increase. <laughs> Yeah, so what we typically see people doing is having a look at what the average increase will be over that five years. So right, okay. But yeah, I'd be happy to drop you an email about that and uh, get a bit more information from you, and perhaps we could work something further out. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Are there any other questions from, from anyone at all? Right, there's there's nothing nothing coming through, um, but perhaps Charlie, if, if obviously your your email address is on the on the end of the presentation, yes. so yes. Um, when I email around to everyone later, I'll just I'll, I'll send your email address around as well, and then if anyone's got any any questions that sort of come to mind off the back of this, um, they can they can get in touch with you directly. Okay, perfect. That sounds good. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. Well, I think that that brings um, everything to an end then. Um, thanks to Martin, Charlie, Matthew, and Yvette for sharing their insight. Um, and I'll send everyone a link to the to the podcast of the webinar shortly. Thanks for joining thanks. us. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.